This is the story of the Battersea Poltergeist, a tale that transcends the Hitching's small family home and weaves its way into the annals of the paranormal. It's a narrative that challenges our understanding of reality, a reminder that sometimes the most ordinary places can become the backdrop for the most extraordinary events. Stay tuned to the very end for a twist that will question everything you believe about the boundary between life and the afterlife. Let me know in the comments whether you believe this is real or not and why. Like and subscribe for more great videos like this one. Okay, let's get into it. In the quaint Battersea district of southwest London, the Hitchings family resided in a modest two-story home at 63 Wycliffe Road. This dwelling, divided to accommodate two households, was a sanctuary for young 15-year-old Shirley Hitchings, her parents Wally and Kitty, her grandmother Ethel, and her adopted brother John. Their lives, interwoven in close quarters, were the epitome of contented simplicity, until the day the ordinary became extraordinary. On January 27, 1956, the tranquility of their home was shattered. It began with an enigmatic ornate silver key, four inches in length, mysteriously placed upon Shirley's pillow. This key, which seemed to belong to another time and another place, fitted no lock in their Victorian abode. That night, a symphony of knocks and taps emanated from the walls and floors, a relentless cacophony that persisted into the early hours, drawing the ire of neighbors and the scrutiny of the police to no avail. The disturbances soon wove themselves into the fabric of Shirley's existence. The tapping followed her, a spectral shadow from the confines of her home to the bus rides and even to her workplace in Selfridges, where she served as a seamstress. Accusations for the noises flew, scissors vanished, and Shirley found herself unjustly blamed, resulting in her employment being abruptly severed. The key, an object of fascination and fear, seemed to possess a will of its own, appearing and disappearing on whims, until one day it vanished entirely. Some say it was a harbinger, a symbol of a doorway flung open between the living and the dead, heralding the onset of events that would grip the nation and echo through the halls of Parliament. On a cold February night in 1956, the Hitchings family's home in Battersea was alive with more than just the winter chill. The strange occurrences that had begun with an inexplicable key on Shirley's pillow escalated into a full-blown haunting. Objects took flight as if possessed by an invisible force. A glove hurled itself through the air, slippers paraded around the room, and a skirt danced in the hallway, all to the bewilderment of young Shirley. The family's living room, their sanctuary with the prized television set, a luxury at the time, became a stage for the unexplained. The knocking and scratching that had become their unwanted soundtrack now competed with the voices from the TV, making even the simplest pleasures like watching a show an ordeal. As night fell, the phenomena grew more personal and more terrifying. Shirley, who shared a cramped room with her parents due to her sleepwalking, found herself in the grip of the unseen. Her bed became a battleground, with sheets being pulled despite her desperate attempts to hold on. Her parents, seeking to prove she wasn't the cause, watched in horror as their daughter's body arched and levitated above the bed, an event that defied all reason. The disturbances continued, growing so loud that they spilled over into the lives of their neighbors, prompting complaints and concern. The Hitchings family, once living a quiet life, now found themselves at the center of a paranormal storm that showed no signs of abating. In the winter of 1956, the Hitchings' Battersea home transformed from a place of eerie disturbances to a theater of the supernatural. Objects defied gravity, soaring with alarming velocity, targeting walls and bystanders alike. The whispers of the haunting had spread, reaching neighbors, the landlord, and soon, the voracious ears of the national press. The entity, once a mere whisper in the dark, had been christened with names like Charlie Boy and Spooky Willie. But it was the newspapers that spun tales of flying clocks and self-walking slippers, sensational stories that gripped the public's imagination. A curious reporter, seeking answers, devised a simple code. One tap for yes, two for no, three for uncertainty. The questions began. Are you evil? No. Can we help you? Yes. Do you have a message for Shirley? Yes but the message's delivery was shrouded in mystery, promised for a Sunday that held breaths in suspense. 
The spirit's identity danced between the visage of Shirley's deceased grandmother and a young boy named Donald, a childhood playmate. The narrative twisted and turned, with reporters weaving tales of a tragic overseas death that proved false. Donald, the boy, was alive, yet the poltergeist bore his name henceforth. The tale took a cruel turn, as fabricated romances bloomed in print, a stark contrast to Shirley's denials. Ethel, Shirley's grandmother, a stern figure with tales of souls departing and ghostly visitations, remained wary of communicating with the spirit. On the 21st of February in 1956, the tale of Shirley Hitchings and her ethereal housemate Donald had not only captivated the press, but also piqued the interest of the BBC. An interview was swiftly arranged, beckoning Shirley to recount her story under the glaring studio lights. Exhaustion clung to her, a byproduct of a night filled with Donald's promised antics. Shirley had inquired if the poltergeist would grant them a night of peace, only to be met with a resounding denial, echoed through a series of emphatic knocks. As darkness enveloped their Battersea home, the nocturnal symphony commenced. The knocks crescendoed, a glove took flight with a mind of its own, and bedsheets were stripped away in a ghostly tug of war. Even Ethel, Shirley's grandmother, wasn't spared, as her room became a stage for the inexplicable. Yet, Shirley braved the spotlight, sharing her harrowing experiences on the show highlights. But Donald, perhaps shy of the public eye, remained silent, a stark contrast to his usual boisterous self. This attempt by the BBC to contact the poltergeist on primetime TV was even spoken about by the Home Secretary in the House of Commons in Westminster. The Hitchings residence at 63 Wycliffe Road had transformed from a family home into a national spectacle. Curiosity drove throngs of spectators to breach the boundaries of their garden, seeking a brush with the supernatural. The family's patience wore thin, their privacy invaded, their longing for normality growing ever more desperate. In the midst of this frenzy, Harry Hanks, a family friend and spiritualist, stepped forward, attempting to bridge the gap between worlds. Wally, initially hesitant, consented as the haunting intensified. The era was ripe with fascination for the otherworldly, and the Ouija board, though controversial, was a popular medium. Yet, Wally and Kitty staunchly opposed its use within their walls. Instead, Hanks employed a simpler method, laying out letters and relying on Donald's knocks to spell out messages. Despite Donald's questionable literacy, his attempts at communication mostly found their mark, painting a clearer picture of the unseen presence that had so thoroughly upended their lives. In the dim light of Harry Hanks's Stockwell abode, a circle formed on the 22nd of February 1956, with Shirley Hitchings at its heart. The air was thick with anticipation as Hanks, his family, and a clairvoyant joined hands, ready to confront the entity known as Donald. The press, ever hungry for a story, watched with bated breath, their cameras poised. Hanks, persuasive and determined, had convinced Shirley's reluctant parents to agree to this seance, a ritual he claimed would rid them of the poltergeist once and for all. As Hanks slipped into a trance, his features contorting in the dimness, a sudden commotion erupted. A loud banging, a sound not from the beyond, but from the very real presence of the police at the door, alerted to possible black magic within these walls. The officers, skeptical yet dutiful, surveyed the scene, eventually satisfied that no laws were being broken. With their departure, Hanks resumed, his body shaking, his voice booming with the authority of his spirit guide. He declared victory. Donald was gone, the exorcism a success. A calm settled over the room, a fleeting peace that suggested the end of their ordeal. But the respite was short-lived. The next day, two reporters arrived, claiming John, Shirley's brother, had granted them an interview with his sister. John, however, knew nothing of this. The reporters, bearing sweets and fizzy drinks, lured Shirley away, a disturbing manipulation of a young girl's trust. During the interview, the familiar tapping and knocking manifested, seemingly emanating from Shirley herself. Skepticism arose, the reporters pinpointed the source to Shirley's foot. Upon removing her boot, the noises ceased. They discovered Shirley's hammer toe, a deformity that allowed her to produce a loud clicking sound. The reporters surmised this was the source of the mysterious rappings attributed to Donald. Shirley, unaware of their motives, complied with their requests for photos, her exhaustion and hunger overshadowing her confusion. 
She longed for nothing more than to return to the safety and comfort of her home. The haunting of 63 Wycliffe Road continued, a tale of intrigue and suspicion, where the lines between the supernatural and the explainable blurred into the annals of paranormal history. In the shadowed corners of the Hitchings' Battersea home, the silence was shattered as Shirley returned, and with her, the poltergeist's wrath reawakened. The house, once still, now thrummed with the eerie percussion of knocks and bangs. As the clock struck eleven, the night's stillness was broken by a tempest of activity. Photo frames took flight, slippers were hurled with intent, and even Ethel, the matriarch, found herself the target of an unseen assailant. The paranormal onslaught didn't end with airborne objects. A fire, as if sparked by an invisible hand, licked at the sheets of the front bedroom. Its flames doused before disaster struck. In another bizarre twist, Shirley's watch, once secure on her wrist, vanished only to reappear with pieces missing at her father's feet. Wally's threats to call the police on the poltergeist, a notion that bordered on the absurd, seemed to coax the entity into returning the rest of the watch albeit in a twisted form. The public's fascination turned to skepticism when a headline in the Weekend Mail proclaimed, Spook was in girl's big toe. The article insinuated the haunting was a farce, the mysterious taps nothing more than the clicks of Shirley's hammer toe. It painted a picture of a girl's mind, so steeped in horror stories and ghostly tales, that she had conjured the haunting herself, unwittingly or not. Shirley stood firm against the accusations, insisting on the reality of the events, even as the article omitted the witnessed chaos of papers strewn by an unseen force. Yet the damage was done. Shirley was branded a liar, her credibility tarnished in the public eye. Amidst the turmoil, a solitary figure emerged, driven not by fame or fortune, but by a genuine passion for the paranormal. This man, a tax office worker by day and a paranormal researcher by night, approached the Hitchings' residence on the 6th of March. With a knock on the door of 63 Wycliffe Road, he introduced himself as Mr. Harold Chibbett, a man determined to unravel the mystery of Donald the Poltergeist. Born into the dawn of the 20th century, Harold Chibbett's life was a tapestry of curiosity and imagination. From the streets of Islington, North London, his fascination with the paranormal and science fiction intertwined, fueling his creative spirit. A member of the London Science Fiction Club, Harold penned tales of otherworldly realms, his words a bridge between the known and the unknown. His passion for the mysterious led him to cross paths with the likes of Alistair Crowley, kindred spirits in the quest for understanding the unexplained. Harold's dedication birthed The Probe, a collective of British investigators delving into psychic and occult phenomena. Yet, it was the peculiar case of Donald the poltergeist that ensnared the Hitchings family, that beckoned Harold with its siren call. Harold's pursuit was not for fame or the flash of press cameras, it was a quest for truth. The Hitchings, wary from false promises of spirit whisperers, found solace in Harold's sincerity. His approach was methodical, his intent pure. He sought to unravel the haunting from its inception, a tale that began with a solitary key. As the Hitchings recounted their ordeal, Harold listened his mind piecing together the puzzle he had joined midway. The 8th of March marked a crescendo of activity. Shirley's watch lay crushed, household items took flight, and the air was thick with the incessant tapping and scratching of an unseen presence. Donald's antics grew bold, demanding a private audience with a reporter, Michael Kirsch, through cryptic messages tapped out in the darkness. Get Kirsch! the poltergeist insisted, a chilling promise of retribution hanging in the air. The days that followed were a whirlwind of paranormal fervor, levitating fire pokers, a bed possessed by tremors, and a gold cross that vanished only to reappear as if by magic. Amidst the chaos, Donald's tapping morphed into a macabre melody, a tune out of sync, yet the family found themselves drawn into its rhythm, singing along to the ghostly beat. In the depths of the night on February 22, 1956, the Hitchings' home was a stage for the inexplicable. Donald, the poltergeist, had a new demand, the presence of reporter Ronald Maxwell. The family, weary and anxious, recorded the persistent messages tapped out by an unseen hand. Get Maxwell, Kirsch is no good. I will set the house afire if you don't get Maxwell. 
The night stillness was pierced by three orbs of light, drifting eerily through the room, a prelude to the night's sinister performance. A match, struck as if by an invisible force, floated towards Shirley, singeing her eyebrows as it descended. The early hours brought a chilling promise from Donald. Get Maxwell, or else. The haunting took a dark turn. Bedsheets in the front room erupted into flames, and Wally, Shirley's father, bore the marks of the struggle. A gash and a burn, possibly the work of the poltergeist. Seeking respite, Shirley fled to her Aunt Nell's, but Donald's reach knew no bounds. The first night was punctuated by knocks and taps, a haunting lullaby for the weary. Shirley went back home, but upon Donald's insistence, she returned to Aunt Nell's, where the poltergeist's activity crescendoed. Messages were tapped out, a spectral communication urging Aunt Nell to fear not, for he was there to protect. Yet, protection felt far from what transpired. Bedsheets were stripped away, objects hurled through the air, a night of unrest and fear. On March 17th, Joyce Lewis, a reporter from the South London Advertiser, sought to witness the haunting firsthand. Accompanied by John Heal, she prepared to share Shirley's bed, binding Shirley's arms and legs with insulating tape to dispel any doubts of human interference. The night unfolded with a cacophony of scrapes and the unsettling dance of the bedsheets, tugged by unseen hands. As the clock neared 1 a.m., the room was filled with the scent of violets, swiftly soured to the stench of burning rubber. Shirley, now asleep and under the watchful eye of Joyce, had a sudden scratch appear on her leg. Despite Joyce's firm grip on Shirley's limbs, the marks manifested from out of nowhere. The night progressed with a cacophony of bangs and the bed shaking violently, yet Shirley remained in a deep slumber, undisturbed by the bedlam around her. At 2.05 a.m., Joyce felt a tickling sensation at her ankle, a playful yet sinister touch that she attributed to Donald, the alleged poltergeist. Her objections were met with the bedsheets being stripped away once more. Half an hour later, Shirley, still asleep, was being pulled from the bed by an invisible force. Joyce's attempts to rescue her were in vain until Shirley awoke, finding herself precariously perched between the safety of her bed and the unknown. After enduring hours of unrelenting tapping, scratching, and the unsettling sensation of being watched, the pair took a brief respite for tea at 4 a.m. Upon their return, Shirley cried out, feeling an odd sensation around her big toe. To their horror, they discovered a string tied tightly around it, a string that seemed to appear out of nowhere, a mocking gesture from the entity they called Donald. Exhausted and overwhelmed, Joyce left the Hitchings residence, her story in tow, convinced that something inexplicable was indeed occurring within those walls. In the days that followed, the activity intensified, with messages tapped out in a sinister tone, some even in French, requiring translation. La Manche, one message read, hinting at a connection to the English Channel, though its true meaning remained shrouded in mystery. The messages ranged from nonsensical to threatening, with Donald claiming to hail from the atmosphere and possessing knowledge of extraterrestrial life. Harold Chibbert pondered whether Donald was more than just a poltergeist, perhaps an alien entity. His inquiries about space travel were met with claims of life on Mars, Saturn, and Venus. But the conversation took a dark turn, as Donald issued threats of setting fires and unleashing atomic gas. The family found their electric stove turned on repeatedly, despite being unplugged, and burnt paper beneath Ethel's bed. The levitation of objects, like a bottle of milk hurled at Shirley, continued amidst the growing menace. As the haunting persisted, Donald began to communicate in a new, yet-to-be-revealed manner, leaving the Hitchings family and all who entered their home to wonder what other secrets lay in wait within the walls of Number 63. On March 22, 1956, Shirley Hitchings' life took a turn for the bizarre when she discovered a message penned in a notebook with a blue ballpoint pen, allegedly by Donald, the poltergeist haunting her family's home. The scribbled note, barely legible and deeply unsettling, read, Shirley, I come, my Shirley. This eerie message was just the beginning, as Donald would go on to write numerous letters filled with odd requests and information. Harold Chibbert, the paranormal investigator, was skeptical that Shirley herself wasn't the author. To test this, he locked a pen and pad in a room overnight and took the only key home with him. 
The next day, he found nearly 60 letters, supposedly written by the poltergeist, with no sign of entry from the family. Despite this new method of communication, Donald reverted to his old ways, tapping out messages, including one insisting Shirley stay at her Aunt Nell's house for peace. Shirley enjoyed a restful night at her aunt's, but the respite was short-lived. The threats resumed, with Donald demanding the presence of reporter Maxwell and threatening to set the house ablaze. Over the following weeks, the demands and threats became repetitive. One night, Donald ordered Shirley to sleep with her grandmother, Ethel, who refused to be dictated to by a ghost. In response, Donald tapped out insulting messages, calling Ethel a silly old cow and mocking her appearance. Amidst the written letters and insults, Donald's voice was occasionally heard. Once, Aunt Nell's husband's missing cufflinks mysteriously reappeared, and a faint yes was heard when Nell inquired if Donald was responsible. The family, feeling safer on the kitchen floor, learned from Donald that other entities, Mickey and Dopey, also visited, using his power and threatening to start fires. The haunting continued in this vein. With Donald's threats to burn the house down, and his chaotic antics of throwing objects around. The Battersea poltergeist's activity, whether it was Donald or another entity masquerading as him, remained a menacing and disruptive force in the Hitchings household. In the unsettling saga of Shirley Hitchings, the Battersea poltergeist case took a new turn that saw the involvement of the police, who insisted on psychological intervention. Shirley, resistant to both the medication prescribed and the idea of being taken into care, found herself at the center of a bizarre incident where her medication was discovered dissolved in water, a phenomenon she attributed to Donald, the poltergeist. Harold Chibbett and his methodical investigations became a fixture in the Hitchings' home, his visits bringing a semblance of order to the chaos. He proposed communication with the spirit as a solution, yet he remained vigilant against being deceived by human orchestrations of the events. Donald's antics escalated, with persistent demands for specific reporters to visit, promising to unveil his true identity upon their arrival. His fixation on reuniting Shirley with a childhood friend, coupled with messages in French, hinted at a past shrouded in mystery. Claims of French origins, a drowning in the English Channel, and references to Dauphin, a term associated with French royalty, led Chibbet to speculate wildly about Donald's identity. Despite these revelations, Donald's credibility was questionable, especially when he professed to speak Martian. The haunting continued with its familiar pattern, threats of arson, objects hurled through the air, and Shirley's grandmother, Ethel, pushed to her limits by the constant disturbances and a chilling encounter with what she believed was her deceased mother's voice. Sadly, shortly after this event, Ethel had a stroke and died in hospital but her departure from the home did little to appease the entity. Donald's rage manifested in more aggressive behavior, tipping paint onto Shirley and intensifying the threats. Amidst the turmoil, Donald deflected blame, suggesting the emergence of a new, malevolent presence. The mystery of the Battersea poltergeist, with its blend of the mundane and the otherworldly, remained as perplexing as ever. Connecting the French messages, Harold believed that the poltergeist might actually be the lost French prince, Louis XVII, who supposedly perished in prison during the tumultuous times of the French Revolution. When asked, Donald confirmed this to be the case. However, Donald's presence was marked by a series of inexplicable events and cryptic communications. His claims were a patchwork of historical facts and glaring inaccuracies. He once stated he was born in 1798, which contradicted the timeline of Louis XVII's demise in 1795. Donald even connected himself to the theatre, naming actors from the era, which seemed like a significant breakthrough until a TV guide was discovered, listing those very names. This raised suspicions that the information could have been easily acquired by Shirley. The haunting persisted relentlessly throughout 1956, a year filled with constant paranormal activity. The following year, while still eventful, saw periods where the disturbances ceased for months. Yet, there was no denying Donald's presence. Shirley's life was deeply affected by the haunting. Her attempts to bring boyfriends home were often thwarted as Donald's antics scared them away. She felt that the poltergeist had robbed her of her teenage years. 
However, in 1964, Shirley met Derek, and they moved to the South Coast. Donald, surprisingly, chose to remain at the old house. Despite the distance, Donald continued to send messages, keeping Shirley informed about her family's affairs. The last communication from Donald came in 1968, a simple note stating his departure, I go. With that, the haunting ceased, as mysteriously as it had begun. In an unexpected twist, Shirley's mother Kitty found herself missing the spectral presence. For 12 years, Donald had been an integral part of their lives, and his absence left a void that was felt deeply, despite the relief of the rest of the family. In the 1980s, a decade after the strange occurrences that had once filled her life with eerie wonder, Shirley found herself at a craft fair. Amidst the hum of the crowd and the display of handmade treasures, a medium approached her with a message that would send a chill down her spine. The medium described a spirit that lingered around Shirley, a young boy dressed in a blue suit, his hair a fiery shade of red. This spectral child had a message for her, a simple yet heartfelt apology for all the trouble he had caused in her life. Shirley was stunned. The description brought back a flood of memories, particularly of a time when Harold Chibbet had been in France. During his travels, he had come across a postcard that depicted a young prince, Louis, dressed in a striking blue suit with piercing blue eyes and locks of strawberry blonde hair. Harold had sent this postcard to Shirley, and now, years later, the medium's words seemed to connect the dots of a mystery that had long been left unsolved. The spirit of the boy in the blue suit, with his apologetic whisper, seemed to be reaching out from the past seeking forgiveness and offering Shirley a sense of peace she hadn't realized she needed. The Battersea Poltergeist story teaches us to show empathy and support to those experiencing difficulties, even when we don't fully understand their situation. Think about this. If you were being haunted by a poltergeist, wouldn't you want that too? Hi, I'm Simon. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed or learned anything about what you've just seen, then please like us and hit that subscribe button. We're just getting started, so you'd be doing us a huge favor. It really helps out a small channel like this one. I hope we earned your subscription today, but if we didn't, I promise we'll keep making great videos until we do. Join us next time when together, we'll once again enter the darkness.